and then up here various uh, switchery connected with the uh, flying controls engine fire handles there more fire, uh, flying control stuff there raft of different switchery up there connected with the engines mainly and then coming back here of course to the flight engineers panel I think I really ought to leave Bill to go through that perhaps with you because it's without doubt the most complex um, flight engineers panel on any aeroplane in the world uh, a fascinating look at a, the driver's view of what Concord is all about and I think uh, it wouldn't be too unfair to John to say he comes over as an extremely respectable sober level-headed kind of guy or is he really because this is the man who one day decided to jump out of a perfectly serviceable aircraft with nothing more than a bit of fabric hanging over his head John having undergone a day of ground training has now taken off from Weston on the Green with the RAF Sport Parachute Association to experience a technique called accelerated freefall a brand new method of training John's instructors are hanging on to him to make sure that he stays in this stable free fall position. A tumble at this stage could be very uncomfortable and possibly dangerous. And they have now reached a speed of about 120 miles an hour. After a fall of 8,000 feet comes the moment to pull the parachute. Now what made John's jump so special is that it was the first time in Britain that anyone had used a square ram air parachute for their first jump. Normally accelerated free fall beginners use a conventional circular one. John had a parachute that he could actually fly. For one, two thousand feet, we'll do a spiral dive to the left now. One turn. John's instructors, Sergeants Nigel Rogoff and Steve Thomas, led the way to the white gravel landing mark. And that's the target John had to aim for. Head to the left. Head to the left. I'm flying now. Coming close. Credit for these marvellous pictures must go to Chief Instructor, Flight Sergeant Steve McBrine and fellow cameraman, Warrant Officer Joe France. Holiday Air's producer was Rick Gardner. And remember, this is the first time John has ever parachuted. Keep going, John! Keep going! That's the most amazing experience, it really is. It's like flying, it's the most incredible sense of freedom. I really haven't ever known anything like that. I just can't believe that this has all happened in one day. I've spent 31 years of my life avoiding jumping out of a serviceable aeroplane, and I've done it after all these years. My only regret is that I didn't do it years ago. It's absolutely fantastic. What a ridiculously good landing on your first jump. I mean, you'd have thought he'd have had the decency to trip over or something. Chris Norris is the uh, first officer on this Concorde flight. Chris, is this a good moment to have a quick word? Certainly, yes. Um, what, what was your personal career progression that's seen you sitting there in the right-hand seat? I joined the BOAC, the predecessor to British Airways, on the VC-10 aircraft, which I flew for eight years. And then I moved into the right-hand seat of the Concorde some 11 years ago and I've been here ever since. It's nearly coming to an end now because I've reached the top of the co-pilot's uh, seniority list and that means that uh, within the next 12 months I should be getting a command. Because Concorde is a very senior aircraft in British Airways, very popular, it tends to be flown by senior captains, so I'll have to take my command on one of the subsonic types of aircraft. 
Uh, do you know yet what sort of aircraft that will be? I don't know. It will probably be uh, one of the short haul types. I would think maybe the 757, the Boeing 757. The role of the first officer is very much more than just sort of a deputy to the captain. Can you just explain what you are actually responsible for on this flight? Yes, the, the, the way that uh, we operate the flight is that uh, the captain flies, does half of the flying, and he normally allows his co-pilot to, to do the other half. So, for example, on this flight, John would fly it all the way to Miami today, and, and then he'd allow me to fly it back tomorrow. So he would then act as, as my co-pilot. But on the way out today, the co-pilot's job is to support the captain I mean, I do all the radio calls to the, to the ground control um, if he wants any the undercarriage raised the, the landing wheels raised or the nose and visor raised all the movements that uh, like that I do for him to leave him free to fly the aeroplane I mean, the thing that fascinates me about um, the kind of work you're involved in is that you are continually being tested I mean many people in there their work cycle, they get used to interviews and yeah. maybe the occasional board. And, uh, you're being checked out regularly, both for your medical status and, and for your, obviously, your competence. Yes. Does that put a strain on you? I don't think so. It's something you get very used to. Uh, we, we do a simulator check. Uh, that takes two days every six months, a medical check every six months, various other checks, checks on safety procedures annually. I think it's something that airline pilots, airline crews in general, get used to. It's, no, I wouldn't say it puts, puts pressure on us. No. Chris, thank you very much indeed. He's the, the kind of aviation enthusiast who every weekend turns up at club meets and air rallies. And there's one event which is held annually and brings people from all over Europe. Men and women and over 50 different sorts of aircraft take part in the Schneider Trophy Air Race. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Not good enough. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Uncle Terry. That's better. Okay. A camaraderie reminiscent uh, of the Battle of Britain, bringing together as many different types of pilot as aircraft. 59 competitors are here at Bembridge on the Isle of Wight for Europe's largest air race, the Deck Schneider Trophy. It revives in modern form the famous seaplane races held between 1913 and 31. This is a Falco. It's actually one of the oldest aircraft in the race. It was 28 years old, um, classified as a vintage aircraft now, uh, but it's still surprisingly modern in its design, and it's also one of the uh, faster aircraft. It's uh, certainly one of the faster single-engine aircraft in the race, with a speed sort of nudging the 200 miles an hour mark on only a 160 horsepower engine. Is this your aeroplane, in fact? Uh, no, unfortunately, my plane from last year, I crashed about three or four weeks ago. Uh, slight problem of when I was testing the engine, it decided to stop at about 800 feet, and sort of being in a perforated manhole cover, I ended up in a field. So how much flying time have you actually got in this particular type of aeroplane? The flying time, not a lot. <laughs> it's a fun plane to fly, but fly one plane, fly them all, they're all very similar. How many lady air racing pilots are there? Well, for the Friday this year, there were three. Uh, we've managed to get rid of one, <laughs> and it's just Carolyn Evans and I left. I suppose you've got to try and take advantage of the weather conditions all the time. You want to keep low when you're flying into wind and high when you've got the wind behind you. Um, with this aeroplane, we lose a lot of time in climbing and descending, so it's better to pick a height and stick at it. And did you build this yourself? We did, yes. We. Uh, uh, Nora and I went over to Los Angeles, we air freighted a kit over and then uh, built this part-time. Took us about a year. It's really a decision whether you watch television or build an aeroplane or take the dog for a walk. <laughs> the basic intention, of course, is to start all the aeroplanes at set fixed intervals so that if we got it all right, uh, all the aeroplanes would cross the line simultaneously uh, at the end of the race. And, of course, if that ever happened, people would say air racing is far too dangerous. It would have been banned years ago.
Russia. And if you look out on the runway behind me, you'll see more airplanes lined up there for takeoff than I've ever seen before, especially out during the Red Arrows, I think. Like and pennies, they're flying machines. They go up and they up, up, they go down, down, down. They chalk all the ladies and steal all the scenes. When they're up and they up, up, and they're down, down, down. Up, up, down, flying around, looping the loop and defying the ground. They're all frightfully keen, though. Magnificent and pennies. three laps of this 47-mile course which goes around the Solent and across the Isle of Wight to Bembridge, we join co-pilot and broadcaster Brian Wolf approaching one of the five turning points. And round we go, try and clip that turning point. There it is. And we're pulling now quite a lot of G as we pull round the corner. And we'll try and straighten the aircraft up. Our next point is uh, Gillica Point. And it's in the distance there, and I can see a number of aeroplanes. Now it's getting much more bumpy and rough as we lose height. And now, slightly out. It's all right. Well, we just had a a slight emergency there. Uh, that's why I stopped the commentary, simply because our window blew open. I managed to close it. There's the window. First over the line, this beautiful piston engine Provost, flown by group captain Steve Holding and Dave Mickleborough. Rather too well. They were to be disqualified for going too fast. Then the handicapper's dream, like bees around a honeypot, the returning aircraft duck and dive for the line. After two heats and a final, Andrew Brinkley was declared the winner, and Sophia Hemming, the fastest lady. This is one of six air races held in Britain, culminating in the King's Cup. It was a new experience for me, and one which I shall long remember and treasure. Bill, Concord must have generated more miles of statistics than it's actually flown. Of course, a lot of the information revolves around the performance of the aircraft, and presumably much of that is your responsibility. Well, it is. The, the role, really, of the flight engineer is twofold. Uh, operating the aircraft systems, as shown here on the systems panel, and monitoring the pilots up at the front there. We both undergo the same conversion course, so we're basically watching each other during a flight. Can you tell me a little bit about this array of switches and dials that you're scanning yeah. all the time? But the whole panel here, the Flight Engineers panel, is broken down into subsections. Up on the top right, there are three hydraulic systems. Below that, four electrical generation systems. Back up into the centre, there are four air conditioning systems. Then all of this panel here is the fuel system. There are 13 fuel tanks, and the fuel is not only used to feed the engines, it's also used to trim the aircraft. We pump it from the front to the back of the aircraft and then from side to side. It's also used to cool the hydraulics, the engine oil, and the air conditioning air. Back up to the top here, we have two pressurization systems. Down below, there are the secondary engine instruments. The primary engine instruments are at the front of the flight deck and then the engine intake control down here. The next generation of long-haul aircraft, the 747-400, very sadly has no flight engineer, just two pilots. I have a personal theory that the aircraft that will supersede the Dash 400 will be the Dash 500, which will have two flight engineers and no pilot. <laughs> and if all went to worms, could you actually fly this thing and land it? Yeah, on our uh, six monthly simulator checks, we practice crew incapacitation, where we all change seats, I get to fly the aeroplane and the pilots get to work the panel. Is it true that there are, in fact, only two military aircraft in the world that will fly faster than Concorde and they can only sustain Mach 2 for about 15 minutes? This is certainly true, and I also understand there's only four in the world that could scramble and catch us up. Um, but they need reheat all the time they're flying supersonically, whereas we switched ours off at 1.7 and flying now without to use reheat. 
and obviously they require in-flight refueling. Absolutely. Can you imagine an age where Concorde would go to Australia and would get a, a top-up somewhere over Singapore? I don't think I really relish the idea of flying 100 yards behind a KC-135 in 204 feet of Concorde. Well, watch this closely, because some people will have to do that kind of thing. <laughs> they will do. Indeed, this is a quite stunning sequence in which an ex-passenger VC-10, now used as a flying tanker, refuels two tornadoes under the call sign Saxon. Saxon. Make it all heading 020 magnetic. Saxon 1, first turn the south house. Saxon 1, first turn the south. Saxon 2, first turn the port. Saxon 2. In this kind of aerial ballet, the formation has to fly with total precision at 12,000 feet at a speed of 218 knots. The tornadoes came from 617 Squadron, the Dam Busters, and the VC-10 from the 101 Tanker Squadron. Uh, just called, uh, I'm just closing up at 45 feet, and I'm ready to fill the full post. This is that one that said us. Saxon 1, the turn to start. They both called us down. Saxon 1, ready for contact start. We're now at starboard. 39 Ninja, 4110, contact with the stud 4. Roger, thank you for service. Turn you 69. One steady on starboard. Stud 4, yeah. Saxon 2, ready for contact port. We're now at port. 20 feet. Nice. Pushing. Saxon 1, fuel flows. Saxon, after this, uh, after we've got our fuel, we'd like to depart to the west, uh, going to low level. Uh, Roger, understood. Uh, Saxon, confirm you wish to fill to full. Saxon, I'd, uh, Saxon 1 to mark another 1,200 kilograms. Oh, okay. Let's wait one minute. Uh, Saxon 2, you've had a total of 2.6 tonnes so far. Do you want any more? Two negative. These quite extraordinary pictures were shot from another tornado by Flight Lieutenant Jeff Dobson. And the aircraft was flown by Squadron Leader Pete Saxon Dunlop. Had you Let's have a break. I'll do it. And one has had a total of 2.8. Drop him back. Out of contact. I'm just going to forward. Oh, Roger, a total of 2.8 for Saxon 1, and you clear actual on port. The pilot of the VC-10, who's in control of the whole refuelling process, is Flight Lieutenant Tim Dean. Both clear on port, visual. And can you move forward as you depart on the port? And Saxon 6 man, good day, thanks for your help. Oh, dear, thanks very much indeed. Incidentally, at this stage in our Concorde flight, the fuel gauge shows that we've burnt some 50 tonnes. That's about 15,000 gallons. There is one airline down under where a man combines water and air to produce one of the most picturesque flying experiences. The tropical coast of Queensland and the Great Barrier Reef beyond is a place where people come to escape the real world for a week or two. So did Kevin Bow he stayed on to fulfil a childhood dream. The Great Barrier Reef is just such a magic place, and you put that together with flying boats, and it makes a beautiful recipe for a great experience. Today, Sue and Kevin Bow operate the most exotic of transport delights, an airline of old seaplanes and flying boats. Named after the islands it serves, Air Whit Sunday flies over the most spectacular seascapes on Earth. His mind was made up the moment he saw the islands on a family holiday. And quitting a lucrative aerial photography business in Brisbane, he risked everything to overcome the sceptics. It was absolutely wonderful. <laughs> it was just Sue and myself in the one aeroplane, and uh, we'd get up in the morning and look at the weather and say, what do you think about today? And I'd say, well, uh, you know, uh, it should be all right, we'll go to Hayman Island or South Mole or wherever, and uh, we would pack up uh, some gear and hop in the aeroplane and go and land, taxi up on the beach, and uh, we had a little windsock made out of an old beach umbrella pole. Away I'd go, and while I was gone, if anybody else came along, Sue would tell them all about the flights and 
some days we'd be going flat out, other days there'd be gaps in between, and of course Sue would have a bikini on, and I had my swimmers on under the uh, uniform, and I used to just trip off and sunbake for a while, and somebody would come along and go for another flight. One of them to collect the Adamses to go to a land dive. You're going. Now the pressure is on in paradise. So popular was their original idea that today Sue commands an operation carrying thousands of passengers on scheduled and charter flights linking the islands and mainland towns. Arriving by flying boat to a holiday retreat like Hayman Island is now all part of the package. The real adventure begins with a chance to fly in this famous aeroplane, a Grumman Mallard called Tropic Bird, on its way to the Great Barrier Reef. The Mallard is one of the last big boats still flying. It first took off from Grumman's New York factory in Long Island Sound in 1947. Then it flew cameramen to cover shipwrecks in the Atlantic and hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico. Forty years on and stained by a working life in the sun and open sea, the Mallard has survived in remarkably original condition. Today it is flown by just a handful of pilots like Ian Johnson, who moved halfway across Australia to win the coveted wings of a flying boat captain on an aircraft 20 years older than he is. The same sense of romance attracts visitors from all over the world, yet it's not just the allure of skimming over the South Seas. Here is a unique opportunity to reach the outer edges of the Great Barrier Reef for a day. Having been spared a long and often uncomfortable 50 mile journey by sea, Tropic Bird's passengers gently splash down in the sheltered waters of Hardy Lagoon. They have all the time they need now to explore the fantastic coral life that thrives just below the surface. Captain Cook navigated a passage through the Coral Keys on his first voyage of discovery over 200 years ago. Today, they are protected as a marine national park. To those following in Cook's footsteps, it still appears like another world. The Mallard presents its own voyage of discovery. A new generation of pilots have learned to master an art all but forgotten in the 30 years since people first traveled this way. Basically, the left hand temperature is okay now. All we've got to do is take off. A little bit tricky today because the tide is low and uh, there's a lot of reef sticking out up the front. And uh, the straight takeoff front is not actually um, straight. It's got a slight curve in it. Such skills were passed on to Ian by his elder brother Rod, a senior pilot with the airline. It was Rod and Kevin who found the Mallard in Canada, saving her from the scrapyard. After learning to fly her in the waters off Vancouver, they proved her great airworthiness on a daring delivery flight across the Pacific Ocean. Keeping Tropic Bird flying demands careful attention and costly maintenance, especially to her pre-war radial engines. But for Kevin Bow, it's all somehow appropriate that he should preserve such a rare bird over seascapes as exotic as those to be found in the Great Barrier Reef. 